Good morning. Welcome to everyone. I understand that we may have some visitors that are tuning in and we welcome the visitors as well. Uh, just got a text from Brent just a moment ago and wanted to remind everyone that uh, there is the opportunity to participate in the Bible classes online. If you weren't able to do that this morning, uh, you can do that once again on Wednesday evening, and I'm sure you'll be seeing some communications via email, uh, possibly by text as well. And if you're having trouble uh, signing on, uh, I'm sure there are some people that can help you, uh, Nick Smith, Eddie Hammonds, uh, believe it or not, you can even contact me. Uh, I've, I've actually been successful at doing that. This morning, uh, we're gonna sing a couple of songs, and then Greg is going to speak to us for a moment, and then we'll have another song and then he'll bring a lesson to us. Our first song this morning will be number 378, The Solid Rock. And I'd like to encourage everyone, even if you're sitting at home by yourself, I'd encourage you to sing along as we, as we sing these songs this morning. So my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Our next song will be When My Love to Christ Grows Weak. <clears throat> When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to thee, garden of Gethsemane. There I walk amid the shades, while the lingering twilight fades. See it suffering, friendless one, weeping, praying there alone. When my love for man grows weak, when for stronger faith I seek, Hill of Calvary I go, to thy scenes of fear and woe. There behold his agony, suffered on the bitter tree. See his anguish, see his faith, love 
of triumphant still in death. Then to life I turn again, learning all the worth of pain, learning all the might that lies in a full self-sacrifice. We could certainly say that it's strange times that we're living in. And for the past couple of weeks, we have been very focused on our health and maintaining our health. But there will be, undoubtedly, and for some it's already happened, a secondary problem with this, and that'll be loneliness. The fact of being cut off from friends and family for reasons of maintaining health, for not being able to get out and go to the businesses we might typically frequent. All of these things will contribute to loneliness, and it's important at a time like this to remember that Jesus has told us that he can sympathize with everything that we're going through, and that certainly includes the concept of loneliness. When you look at the life of Jesus as he walked the earth, there was absolutely no one who was human who could understand what Jesus was going through. And so even his own family didn't really understand who he was or understand what his mission was. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, I'm looking to chapter 3 as we read about some of the things going on with his family. First of all, in verses 20 and 21, Mark records for us, Then he, Jesus, went home, and a crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And then skipping down just a few verses to beginning in verse 31, it says, And his mothers and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Of course, we know Mary had received word even before the birth of Jesus that she was having a very special child. Yet the confines of her human reasoning prevented her from being able to fully accept who he was. And so one could imagine of the, the comfort that typically is felt from family members who can sympathize and perhaps even empathize with situations we're going through. Now, that was not the case for Jesus. The same could be said for his disciples. Here are these men who were chosen to walk with him while he was on the earth, who for three years spent time with him, looking and watching his miracles, hearing his teaching. And yet even they could not fully appreciate what was going on. I'm going to the Gospel of Luke now, to chapter 18. And as we find uh, here Jesus telling his apostles once again what's about to happen, we see the reaction of, of non-understanding from them. Verse 31 beginning. It says, In taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. The hiding here was nothing from God or from Jesus. The hiding was from their own lack of understanding. Time after time, Jesus had tried to show them, to try to explain to them what was going to happen. Yet, as he enters Jerusalem for this final week, he virtually enters alone. Though there were crowds around him, though the twelve were with him, he'll die alone, lonely from any human companionship of anyone who could fully appreciate what was happening. 
Indeed, the only one who could fully understand was his Father in heaven. And thinking about that makes Jesus' prayer in John 17 that much more pertinent. As we look at the first part of that prayer, verse 1 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And thus Jesus went to his cross, void of human companionship, void of those who fully appreciated the mission that he had been given to do. This morning, as we come to a time of partaking the Lord's Supper, we remember that its primary purpose is to help us to remember the great sacrifice that was made for our sins, that Jesus died on the cross so that by his blood we could enter into a new covenant to remember his body, to remember his blood of that covenant. But a secondary benefit is also to help us fight against loneliness. To remember that no matter where we are, that there are brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world who are exercising the same thing that we're exercising today, to take of the bread and to take of the fruit of the vine. That though we may not be able to see them, we know that they're present and that their hope is our hope. But ultimately... It's to help us to remember that God has not left us alone. In fact, as Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper, he said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, our Lord is with us, and thus we are never alone. And so this morning, as we prepare to partake, I encourage you to remember his presence, to remember what your brothers and sisters throughout the world are doing today as you're doing in remembering. And though you might be feeling lonely, to remember that God is saying, really, you're never alone, that I'm with you. Let's bow together as we give thanks for the bread. Our Holy Father, we're so grateful to you for the great sacrifice that was made for our sins. Father, we're thankful to you that this death means that we can live, that we have opportunity to, by his sacrifice, have our sins forgiven. We're so thankful for our Lord, and we pray, Lord, as we partake of this bread this morning, that you will help us to put this in our minds, to realize the great price that's been paid for us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. In the name of your Son, we pray these things. Amen. We'll now pause for just a moment while we partake of the loaf. Let's now join together as we remember the blood that's been shed for us for that new covenant that the Lord has promised for all who are faithful to him. If you will bow with me. Lord, thank you so much for the great sacrifice that's given for the death that Jesus died on the cross for us. And we're so thankful, though, horrified by what had to be done, 
because of our sins, that you loved us enough and showed your grace and your mercy, that you would allow blood to be shed as that perfect sacrifice to join us in this new covenant. We thank you, Lord, for what's been done, and we pray, Father, that you'll bless us and that you'll help us to remember that as we partake of this fruit of the vine. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Now we'll pause to partake of the fruit of the vine. to sing one more song and then Greg will be bringing us a message of the hour. We'll sing only in thee. Go so me only in thee, O Savior mine, dwelleth my soul in peace divine. Peace that the world, though all combined, never can take from me. Pleasures of earth so seemingly sweet fail at the last my longings to meet. Only in thee my bliss is complete. Only, dear Lord, in thee. Only in thee a radiance bright Shines like a beacon in the night Guiding my pilgrim bark aright Over life's trackless sea Only in thee when troubles molest when with temptation I am oppressed, there is a sweet pavilion of rest. Only, dear Lord, in Thee, only in Thee, dear Savior slain, losing Thy life, my own to gain. Trusting I'm cleansed from every stain, Thou art my only plea. Only in Thee my heart will delight, Till in that land where cometh no night, Faith will be lost in heavenly sight. Only, dear Lord, in Thee. I'll mention that here in just a few minutes, I'm going to be recording a sermon for today, and it should be out this afternoon, uh, no later than 5 o'clock this afternoon, so you can be watching for that. When we think about loneliness 
There are a lot of sad things about loneliness, but one thing that it may help us to realize is what it means to truly be without a relationship with God. To think about it in those terms, to know that Jesus is not with us because we're not with him, to think that the Father and the Spirit are not with us because we are not with them, should leave us with a feeling of great loneliness. And that should be an overwhelming feeling to us. I was thinking about an old song, an old hymn, it's been around a very long time, that was written by Mary Slade. She entitled this hymn, Who at My Door is Standing. And in one of the lines of that hymn, she recorded these words, Lonely without he's staying, lonely within am I. While I am still delaying, will he not pass me by? Her message, I think, is very clear that here is the opportunity to end that loneliness, to invite Jesus to be a part of our lives through becoming a child of God, to becoming a Christian. And yet it's as though, metaphorically speaking, we're staying behind closed doors. We're unwilling to open our lives to him. And the idea of her theme, of the theme of her song is, why are we doing that? Why are we leaving him standing at the door? We do not want loneliness. We don't want anything that's going to lead from him departing from our door. And as I think about these words that were written, I feel quite confident that the hymnist certainly had Revelation 3 in mind with Jesus standing at the door of the church of Laodicea. And in verse 20, Jesus makes this statement to them. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Here Jesus promises fellowship to those who will open the door, but that's our decision. As we've noted in the Lord's Supper this morning, God has done everything that he can do to bring us the opportunity to be saved from our sins, to be ridded of the loneliness and isolation of a life without him because we've cut ourselves off from him. But that doesn't have to be the case. We don't have to be lonely. That door can be open. We are currently living in rather strange times, but I can assure you that if all of this uncertainty that we are all experiencing has led you to really wonder about your relationship with God and to understand that without baptism you're not going to be saved, that you can indeed be baptized. And all you must do is let me know or let one of our elders know and we will make arrangements as quickly as we possibly can to bury you in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of sin. So don't allow excuses, even one as great as what we're currently facing, to keep you from doing what you know needs to be done. Maybe in loneliness you have been reflecting on your life and you realize that there's things that just simply are not right. If those involve another person, why not take the time to pick up the phone and to call this person to straighten things out, to pray together, to reattach that relationship that's been broken. If it's something in your own private thoughts you've done in sin against God, take the opportunity to, to pray to him. If you need others to share with you in this, again, I certainly will make myself available, the elders of this church, and indeed any of the members of this congregation would be happy for a phone call to take place to pray together Whatever it takes, let's not make an excuse in any way, shape, or form, or at any time, no matter what's happening, to keep from allowing Jesus to come into our lives. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning to join us in this time of worship together. At this point, we're going to conclude our broadcast with a prayer, and we'll ask Noble to come back to the mic, and he'll lead us in that final prayer. Before I lead a prayer for us, I just want to remind everyone that uh, the bulletin has been published online. 
Nick put that online about 6.30 this morning, so if you're wanting to access that, you should be able to get that online now. And also, just as a reminder once again, if you're having trouble signing on uh, to the Bible classes or to this live feed, there are several that are willing to help. All you need to do is reach out, and uh, there are others that would be glad to uh, help you with getting that set up. Let's go to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with all humbleness of heart. We thankful Father, we're thankful, Father, for all the many blessings that you bless us with. We're thankful for your watchful care over us. We're thankful, Father, for your Son, Jesus, for the blessings that we have in him, for the hope that we have of heaven, for your revealed word, for the forgiveness of our sins, for his atoning blood. Help us each day, Father, to realize that we have been bought with the price of his blood. Help us, Father, to keep in mind, especially in these times, that we are truly blessed. And help us, Father, to consider these blessings and keep them foremost in our minds and realize, Father, just what you have indeed done for us. At the same time, Father, we pray that it is, if it is your will, that you would deliver us as a people, as a community, as a nation, as a world, from this plight that we are undergoing. We know, Father, when we read from your word that you have delivered your people from terrible things that have occurred in the past, and we pray, Father, at this time that you would deliver us and protect us and help us, Father, to always realize that you are with us. We pray that as we've discussed this morning that you would keep us from loneliness and help us, Father, always to realize that you are near if we'd all but all call upon you. We pray, Father, for many of our number that are in a special need of your care and our attention. We pray for Chris and Quinta and Jackie and Pam and Brad and Dot and Elsie and Madeline and Sandlin and Annette and Lowell and Carol. And there are others, Father. We pray, Father, that you would watch over all of us, keep us in the palm of your hand and keep us in your care. Pray that you would go with us now as we depart. In Christ's name, amen.